An Intro to Hmong Shamanism 102 by Du Fong Li. Let's get started. All right, so the objectives for the 102 series is to understand the concepts of souls and spirits, uh, the different types of souls and spirits that uh, Hmong Shamanism believe in, uh, learn and become familiar with the different types of wild spirits and the relationships and roles they play in Hmong Shamanism, learn the concepts of reincarnation, karma, and sleep paralysis. So we learned from one of one series that Hmong shamanism is a blend of um, other uh, religious aspects such as reincarnation and karma. And then four, uh, a quick overview of soul calling because that plays such an important part in the Hmong soul and also Hmong shamanism. All right, so just to recap from the 101 series, the definition of shamanism. Shamanism is the belief that existing bodies, human or animal, have souls and the physical world or earth coexist with the spiritual world or the spiritual realm. The universe is inhabited by not only humans and animals, but by the spirits and energy. So in other words, shamanism is the belief in the coexistence of the physical world and the spiritual world. And again, like I stated before, shaman, monk shamanism um, has uh, concepts from um, animistic beliefs or animism, uh, reincarnation, and the belief in karma. And just a reminder, the term shamanism can be translated over to neng or Morning. All right, so the spirit. What is the spirit? Are we talking about the Holy Spirit? Um, how many spirits do we have, right? So a spirit or soul in the Hmong is known as Njupli. The Hmong believe there are multiple spirits, 12 to be exact. Um, if you ask other shamans or um yeah, um, other Hmong individuals may believe that we have more. Um, the spirit plays a huge part in Hmong shamanism. In fact, shamanism exists solely because of the spirit of the soul. Everything in the Hmong shamanism belief uh, revolves around the soul and the spirit. When someone passes, their spirit or soul must be guided back to the land of the ancestors or the spirit realm. It plays such an important role as uh, a living person and also as a deceased person, right? Our soul, our spirit needs to be guided back home. Without the concept of the soul or spirit, Hmong shamanism ideology collapse. There would be no shaman, no afterlife, reincarnation, or the spirit realm. The world would only be based on the physical existence without the concept of the soul or the spirit. So souls and spirits play a huge part, probably about 90 to 95 percent of Hmong shamanism. All right, so Hmong shamanism believe, again, that each person has a total of 12 souls or 12 spirits. But there are three main souls, three very important souls that uh, constitute a person's uh, health and well-being. So the first one is the soul that stays with the body and eventually with the grave. We call that the body soul. The second is the soul that, after death, finds the ancestors and stays with them. That's the ancestral soul. And then third is the soul that reincarnates, or the reincarnation soul. And we'll be going over these in specifics. So the first is the body soul. The body soul can become easily sick or ill. Now, because our physical body, we ourselves, is in constant motion and we travel from place to place every single day, we're never just at one place. This, is, this causes our spirit to be exposed to many energies and other spirits and entities that are around us as well. Now, think of how our body is exposed to many germs as we go from place to place. You start out at home, you go to school, you go to work, you go to daycare, you go to the grocery store. We are exposed to multiple germs and illnesses 
throughout the day. But the more that we travel, the more our body is exposed to germs. The more we travel, the more our soul is exposed. And because we are constantly moving and going from place to place, our spirit, like our physical body, can become tired. And it is believed that our body, our soul, can remain in a place and not make it home. And that's what we'll call illness, is, is the body soul. Now, once our soul gets left behind and remains in a place, it becomes very vulnerable to other spirits and other entities around it. So wild spirits and ghosts can easily take our body soul, and at that point, this can cause a person to become very ill. And often when our body soul uh, gets left behind, right, or our body soul is frightened, we'll dream of being in places that we have never seen or that we've never been to. We'll have dreams of following groups of people, other body souls. Uh, we'll dream of being married to someone else, uh, have dreams of being lost and we try to find a way home, things like that. Now, these, of course, this isn't the entire list, but these are some of the symptoms that a person may physically experience if their body soul is left behind or is not with their body. That person might experience weakness, quickly becomes tired, uh, depression, a loss of appetite, sickness or being ill, uh, memory loss or short-term memory loss. Uh, we quickly lose our temper, we experience nightmares, and also sleep paralysis. Again, the list, this isn't the complete list, but these are some of the symptoms that a person may experience if, if their body soul is not with them. Now, the second is the ancestral soul. So the Hmong believe that after death, we are reunited with our ancestors. Our ancestral soul must trace our footsteps and travel back. Now, we know that this happens during funeral services, right? Our soul must take uh, the steps back, take that journey back to our ancestors. Uh, now, the soul must be properly dressed for the long journey back. And again, this happens at funerals. Uh, we must be properly dressed so that our ancestors can recognize us once we arrive. And the journey is not easy. It is very difficult. Um, a person must wear the correct clothing, they must wear the right shoes, um, have spirit money, which we learned about in the 101 series, and they must be guided correctly. This happens at the funeral. Um, when we uh, um, pray to our ancestors, right, we send food to them or we worship them, we are worshiping their ancestral soul, their ancestral spirits. Those are the ones that we pray to, the ones that guide us, the ones that uh, we dream about, or maybe the ones that protect our family. Uh, once in a very long time, you might dream of seeing your great-grandparents or your grandparents who have since long, uh, 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 since long been deceased. Those are the ancestral souls that we are seeing. Now, the Hmong believe that if we dream of seeing our ancestors uh, or deceased friends and family or things of that nature, it is an indication that perhaps our ancestral spirit might have left our body. Uh, symptoms that can tell us this include uh, depression, um, talking about death, uh, feeling very tired all the time, been feeling really sleepy all the time, you have a loss of appetite, um, you randomly dream of traumatic experiences from the past. For example, if it's an elder, they may be dreaming suddenly again about being in the war or running from uh, or escaping from Laos to Thailand uh, during, during the uh, secret war. Uh, those are traumatic experiences from the past. Uh, they may be dreaming about seeing deceased parents or family members, etc. So, again, this doesn't cons constitute the entire list, but these are some of the symptoms that uh, can indicate that the ancestral soul has left the body. 
Now next we have the reincarnation soul. So the reincarnation soul is, is a very complex uh, concept. Um, this is a soul that goes to the beyond to reincarnate. And in Hmong, reincarnation, we call that Haitia. Um, so the Hmong believe that there are 12 roads or kind of 12 stairs to reincarnation. Typically, a person's soul would only go to reincarnate if they are very sick or sometimes they're very, very old or an elderly. Uh, the spirits tend to wander off to the reincarnation stage. Now, when a person has been sick for a very long time or they remain in a coma or, again, they are, you know, 90 to 100 years old, their soul is more vulnerable to, to the reincarnation. Now, once a soul or a spirit does reincarnate, what that means is that that soul is reborn. At this stage, it is very difficult for a shaman to heal a person, and if not, impossible for a shaman to heal that person. Once someone goes to reincarnate, they are reborn. It is Im almost impossible to retrieve that person. Um, and they believe, the Hmong believe that at reincarnation, a soul or a spirit must wash uh, their memories uh, that they have on earth before being able to be reincarnated. Now, it is believed that if a person has any unresolved issues or um, any unresolved cases on earth with other people, or maybe they have any unpaid debt, the reincarnated soul must go back and defend themselves in heaven's court. Heaven's court is understood to be uh, what we call in Hmong, Nyu Va Teng, okay? So if they go to Nyu Va Teng, or heaven's court, um, they cannot reincarnate uh, until they win their case and pay back their debt. Now, if the reincarnated soul cannot defend or they lose their case, that soul will come back in a dream to their living family members and demand for help. So when we dream of deceased family members coming back and asking for help, or they say they are in need of help, that is their reincarnated soul. They need our help in order for them to move on to be reincarnated. The symptoms that um, that the reincarnation soul, a person's reincarnation soul, has left their body includes things like sudden death, uh, a sudden traumatic sickness, a sudden life-changing health issue, such as a heart attack or a stroke, um, things that, that uh, will bring a person to a near-death experience, oftentimes indicate that the reincarnation soul has gone and uh, uh, left the body. All right, so what is reincarnation? Reincarnation is the concept that the non-physical essence of a living starts or begins a new life in a new physical form after their biological death. In Hmong shamanism, reincarnation is a religious concept and it is also a location in which we refer that as Taitia. Now, Taitia can be described as a location where a person's soul goes to, and it can also be used as an act of being reborn again. Uh, there's this story that I like to call, uh, it's called the Bronze Bracelet Story. Now, there was this uh, story of a poor man, a very, very poor man. Um, he um, had, had always gone to this family, this middle-class family, uh, didn't have much, but this family had just enough livestock, enough chickens and pigs and cows, uh, enough to feed their family. And so this this poor man would always go to that family for food, and, and that family was always so so giving, so loving. Uh, the family gave, gave that poor man some chickens and cows and food and, and vegetables. Whatever they had, they were able to uh, give a piece to the poor man. And one day the poor man came to that family. The poor man said, you know, one day when I'm no longer around, I promise you, I'll repay you the kindness and the love that you have shown and given me. And a few days later, that poor man died. He died. 
And um, about a year or two later, there was a drought in the village, drought in the town that killed uh, all the livestock, wiped, wiped out all the vegetables, and the family was struggling. Uh, but one day, the, the dad woke up and he saw a moose, a big moose, a big moose, a big deer. And it was the only moose that they had ever seen for ever on on that land. And uh, the father was able to uh, shoot the moose and savage that meat and feed his family. And upon skinning the moose, he realized that there was a bronze bracelet on the moose's leg, which was the same bracelet that the poor man had. And so this story tells how the poor man came back in his next life through reincarnation to repay his debt to that family and ultimately saved that family uh, that year as well. So we talk about karma. So karma is a spiritual concept of action and reaction. The monk believed that karma is a cause and effect of actions of an individual and its influence on another. The online definition of karma says that uh, karma is the sum of a person's actions in this and previous states of existence viewed as deciding their fate in future existences. So for example, uh, uh, it is basically saying what happens to a person happens because they caused it with their actions. Now, of course, we see that this kind of concept and idea is kind of problematic thinking, right? Um, it is problematic because it is victim blaming and shaming of a person, uh, which doesn't put the responsibility of the wrongdoing to the aggressor or to the right places. Now, in instances of rape and sexual violence and assault, Karma would say that a victim of rape is caused by the actions of that victim. Uh, when we know that this is not to be true, right? The aggressor caused the rape, not the victim. But in instances of karma, uh, they would say otherwise. And that's kind of problematic for, uh, for today. All right, so we do get into the concept of karma and reincarnation. And there's this... Um, term that the Hmong people like to use, the Hmong shamanism like to use, called uh, Dain Da. So Dain Da is a term that can be translated to the paper. The paper or Dain Da is understood as a faded piece of paper, no, not literally, right, that one must carry with them to the afterlife and to reincarnation. It is a document written by fate that describes the new or next life according to how a person lived on earth. Now this document is examined by fate and it determines any karma or unpaid debt that that person has. This also describes things such as fertility, how many children you'll have, uh, when and how you'll die, your career choices, your life decisions, and who you will marry. So Dain Da can be thought of as fate itself. Now the monk believed that everyone is born with it and it is predetermined. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the types of wild spirits or entities. This is the kind of um, topics that I, do, I like to go into because it gets really interesting. Um, so, first of all, I want to talk about the term shu, shu, or wild spirit. So, a wild spirit is considered to be any evil spiritual entity uh, from nature that is not at rest. So, the intentions of a shu is to bring harm, bad luck, sickness, or death. A shu can uh, surround a home causing bad fortune and bad luck to that home and to that family. Uh, it can also surround or feed off of a person. Now, symptoms that indicate a person has been um, affected by a shu uh, or that a shu is attached to a person include things like bad dreams, 
nightmares, sleep paralysis, loss of appetite, memory loss, depression or bipolar, uh, short temper, loss of interest, constant bad luck, and sickness. Now again, th this list isn't complete. It's just a list of symptoms that can indicate it. So uh, we'll be going over some types of shu or some types of wild spirits. The first one is panzong. A panzong is a very powerful evil spirit uh, or creature that causes harm, sickness, and has known to bring death to many, many people. Uh, Bonzong, they wear traditional Hmong clothes and have long black hair. They could have been uh, human at one point. Uh, Bonzong is known to be a follower of the Hmong tiger Chu Sha, uh, which we will go over um, in the next few slides. Uh, Bonzong is known to recruit people. And uh, Bonzong is associated with the cat. So cats today are known to be uh, superstitious to the Hmong culture. And a bonzong is an enemy to the Hmong shaman. So Ju Sha is a type of wild spirit, a wild creature. Uh, probably one of the most famous stories or famous creatures in the Hmong story. Ju um, Sha was once a human. In fact, he was thought of to be from the Lore clan. Uh, he was a necromancer or someone who practiced necromancy, which is the darkest of all black magic. Uh, he was from a poor family, as were most Hmong families during that time due to war and colonization of the French. Uh, and so he used necromancy or black magic to turn himself into a tiger, to eat animals or meat. And legend has it that he remained a tiger and lived in the jungles of Laos. And at first, he only ate cow and pig meat, but then he came after humans as well. And he was very powerful, and he killed many people, uh, shamans and beautiful men and women. And anyone who showed any form of talent or beauty was recruited by Ju Sha. And people were so scared of him, right? Even to this day, that people don't say his name out loud. The next one is Pinyu Vai. So Pinyu Vai uh, is a strong and evil creature that lives in the jungles of Laos. Uh, it can transform into anything or anyone, but uh, it is said to be uh, most in the form of a monkey. Uh, it is said that the Pinyu Vai will be behind you, eating your intestines, and you wouldn't know it. And when you go back home, you'll experience stomach pains, and then you'll die. And legend has it that burning a special type of wood, wet wood, uh, in the jungles will bring out the Pinyuai. They say the clouds will change colors and you'll hear monkey-like noises coming towards you. That is indication that a Pinyuai is nearby. Now, there's what we call Dano Nu Dano Li or Dano Tu Dano Ki, right? So the Dano Tunaki is a type of evil entity that eats the fertility of a person, thus not allowing the couple to have children. Uh, the entity also causes little children to cry at night, among many other things, and can cause little children to be sick. Um, the Dano Tunaki is uh, thought of to be responsible for um, miscarriages and stillbirths as well. Um, so uh, next, the Danon Nu and Danon Li. Uh, this type of evil entity causes a person to become mentally insane or kind of schizophrenic. Uh, it will cause them to lose their mind and cause them to see dead spirits and ghosts and hallucinate and do things like eat at live animals and eat flesh and things of that nature. Next we have Daja and Dajo, right? So Daja is what we call the dragon spirit. Now the monk believe in uh, powerful dragon spirits that live in lakes and ponds that cause death by drownings. 
Daisha is also responsible for deaths by stomach pain. So back in the day, uh, monk people will experience swollen stomachs um, or, or swollen bellies, which the monk believe is filled with water, hence the dragon spirit. And people often died from this. But what we know now is that oftentimes that is caused by mal malnutrition um, and other types of diseases. But during that time, the monk believed it was because of this dragon spirit. And there are many stories of dragon spirits recruiting people to be their spouses or partners. For example, there are stories of many men who uh, go off and marry dragon spirits. The dragon spirit causing illness to that man and then ultimately death. Uh, the Da Chao or the tiger, this is a tiger spirit that is very powerful. Uh, they are known to be recruits of Jisha. Um, right, so those are just kind of the list of some wild spirits and some wild entities. It is not at all the complete list, but those are the most famous or well-known, well-heard of uh, entities. And we're going to spend a few slides and a few minutes on sleep paralysis, which I think is a really important um, and kind of interesting topic for the Hmong. Um, so sleep paralysis is a rapid eye movement disturbance or REM disturbance. And we experience REM sleep in stage four of sleep. So sleep has um, a series of four stages and stage four is the last stage of sleep. It is also the stage where we experience REM sleep. We experience dreaming, right? Which is also ironically the kind of um, the brain parts that are activated during dreaming, during stage four, almost translates over to the brain parts that activate during uh, hallucinations. So that's interesting. So because we experience this in stage four, again, the last part of last stage of sleep, that's why we often wake up uh, after a dream or we wake up after paralysis. It's the closest stage to the waking stage. Um, during stage four, we may experience, or during sleep paralysis, we may experience uh, things like hallucination, uh, hearing voices or sounds. Um, we may be experiencing odd vestibular sensations, a difficulty or constricted breathing, chest pains, inability to move, hence paralysis. Uh, these are kind of the symptoms that happen during sleep paralysis. We oftentimes are aware of what is happening, um, aware of our sensations and the physiological paralysis of our body during sleep paralysis. So sleep paralysis is not unique to the Hmong. Um, it is experienced throughout the globe, throughout many cultures. And many cultures tend to have mythical or superstitious beliefs or explanations about sleep paralysis. Research shows that there are four out of every 10 who experience sleep paralysis. Uh, below are just some of the pictures that I found um, off the web, often depicting um, creatures or spirits or ghosts sitting on our chests uh, as an indi indication of paralysis. All right, so what does the research say about sleep paralysis? There was a survey done uh, to a group of people, about, about 10,000 people, uh, about sleep paralysis. So the first chart on the left here, how, how often do you uh, have sleep paralysis? There was a total of 10,000 uh, uh, replies, right? And so, 22.8% report 2 through 10 times in my life, uh, going down to 1% who experience it every night. The survey in the center, what age did you first have sleep paralysis? There was a total of 19,000 votes or surveys. 49%, um, almost half, right? a report experiencing their first sleep paralysis between 13 and 19 
between adolescence and the end of adolescence, which we do know as well, we experience the most hormonal changes in those times. Um, and about um, 21% report for the ages of 20 to 29, and 21% for ages under 13. Uh, the chart on the right, how scared are you during sleep paralysis? There were about 10,000 uh, votes and surveys and a scale of one being not scared and 10 being terrified. We had about 52.9% um, uh, report being terrified, report being on the 10 scale. We have about 13.1% for still being scared, right? Still being terrified. Uh, and we have about majority of, of um, I would say, the people who experience sleep paralysis report being terrified. So Hmong shamanism on sleep paralysis. So the Hmong believe that sleep paralysis is due to an entity known as Zhe Zhuo. A jaw is a wild spirit, typically from nature, that follows people and feeds on their energy or life. It causes them to be tired, restless, fear of the dark, uh, fear of loud noises, agitation, short-temperedness, memory loss, trouble sleeping, a loss of appetite, weight loss, and in some, some serious cases, a loss of reality, and even death. Those are just kind of kind of some of the symptoms that a person may experience uh, during sleep paralysis. Um, and they are believed to come and sit on the chest or the body of a person as seen uh, from those pictures that we saw earlier. Um, one experiences uh, paralysis because it takes away your energy, uh, causing you to um, be uh, unable to move as your life source is being sucked out from you, from this entity. Um, a jaw can be a black shadow, a figure, a bonzong, um, and in some cases an animal and even an alien-like figure. Alright, so what do you do if you are experiencing sleep paralysis? First, it's important to seek medical and professional attention uh, from a medical provider or professional to determine if your sleep paralysis is caused uh, due to stress or sleep disorders. It's very important to get to always seek medical attention first. Um, and from a spiritual perspective or from a spiritual solution, uh, it may be wise to seek uh, a red and white protection string or amulet from a shaman or a spiritual healer. Um, another thing that you can do is cleanse your home. And some people believe that pear tree or a pear branch uh, can help keep a ghost or wild spirit out. So if you happen to have pear tree or pear branches or pear leaves, hang this on your door and by your windows. Uh, and in some cases, a soul calling may be needed. Uh, an ornang or shaman ritual may also be required uh, for serious cases. So I have some quiz questions and then we're going to go over... Uh, uh, soul calling, all right? So the first quiz question is, which is not one of the three main souls? Which is not one of the three main souls? Is it A, the body soul, B, the ancestral soul, C, the fertility soul, or D, the reincarnation soul? And feel free to pause this as well. But the correct answer is B, the fertility soul. Quiz question number two, the entity that is mostly responsible for sleep paralysis is, is it A, Pinyu Vai, B, Da Zha, C, Zha Zhuo, or D, Spirit Money? The entity that is mostly responsible for sleep paralysis is C, Zha Zhuo. All right, last quiz question. A shoe is is considered to be what? Is it A, a powerful mythical tiger that recruits Hmong women and men? 
B, a dragon spirit that it causes death by drowning. C, a wild creature that eats your intestines. Or D, a wild spirit that is considered to be an evil entity from nature that is not at rest. A Shu is considered to be D, a wild spirit that is considered to be any evil entity from nature that is not at rest. All right, so the last part of our um, webinar, we'll be going over uh, Hoopli or Soul Calling. A hoopli is a soul calling um, as a spirit or soul of a person can be frightened. A soul calling is required to bring the soul of a person back. A soul calling traditionally requires a pair of chickens, a rooster and a hen, rice, one egg per person, jaw sticks, and a pair of cow or buffalo horns. Now soul calling is typically done in a rith rhythm, rhythmic, or a poetry-like form. Now the split buffalo horns are used as a communicative tool that allows the person doing the soul calling to know if the soul has returned or not. How the person knows depends on how the buffalo horns fall or land when they drop it. A hoopla requires the calling of a soul twice, once with uh, the chicken still being alive and the second time when the chickens are cooked. Now the chicken's feet must be facing out towards the door during the soul calling. All right, so once the soul calling is complete, the person uh, eats the cooked eggs and the elders typically gather around to investigate the cooked rooster and hen. Traditional belief says that the rooster and the hen's feet, along with other body parts, can tell us about the soul for whom the hoopli or soul calling was done for. So for example, if the toes of the rooster are all split in every direction, that typically symbolizes that the soul has gone very far and that an awning ritual may be required. Now some people believe that if the egg is cracked while boiling or at any point, it represents bad omen. Some hoopli or soul calling rituals no longer use live animals or chickens. Instead, they use fruits and vegetables. So what are some reasons for a soul calling? There are many reasons why a hoopli or a soul calling ritual is done. Uh, there might be a frightened soul, right? Uh, a birth of a new child requires a soul calling. The welcoming of that soul. Uh, marriage, uh, when a person is very old. Uh, when a person has been given a new spiritual name. When someone is really sick or ill. Uh, the hoopli during New Year's. And also hoopli for celebrations like graduations, getting a new job your recovery from surgery, things of that nature, are all reasons why people do soul calling. All right, so that concludes our webinar for the 102 series. I hope that you guys learned a few things about uh, some concepts of long shamanism, and I look forward to uh, seeing you guys again uh, during our 103 series. Thanks.